everyone. Welcome to New Hope. We are so glad you connected with us online. Before we get started, don't forget to subscribe below and click that notification bell. And now, Pastor Roberto. Amen. How many of you praise God for the gift of freedom? Amen. This is one of those days when we sing God bless America, do we? Right. In this July the 4th weekend, we sing God bless America. And one of the interesting things that you, we find here is that sometimes we find ourselves like merely going through the motions and saying God bless America. Because, you know why I say that? Because when election time comes, then we hate each other. Then we <laughs> talk each other in a not so blessing way, not blessing each other's. Then it doesn't, do we really mean what we sing when we say God bless America on July the 4th? I mean, I think I can hear Jesus like saying, how come you're going to bless this nation? How can I say you're going to bless America and you're not going to bless your fellow Americans? Make sense? How come we're going to say God bless America or again, we're not going to bless our fellow Americans. So saying God bless America, probably it is my hope and my goal that after this message, God bless America will have a whole brand fresh meaning to you this morning. I mean, America, there's nothing more like the promised land on this earth like America. I mean, when you talk to the people in, around the world and you say, think of America, they think of America as a promised land. Yes or no? There's not nothing. I mean, there are all the countries that are doing well. They're doing well economically, socially, and all that. But when people think about the place to go, the place they want to go, the place they feel welcome, the place they can have the freedom, that, that place is nothing else but America. So... God bless America, but what do we mean that we get that? America is the promised land, but how do we understand that concept of being a promised land for many people, for ourselves? The Bible has some interesting scripture for us this morning that actually was written and was, this scripture happened at a time when the people of Israel were about to enter, guess where? The promised land. They had wandered in the desert for, for 40 years and they were ready to enter the promised land. And before they entered the promised land, God gave them this word. God gave them this message. And they, God told them, hey, you're about to enter this land of milk and honey. You're about to enter this land that is a blessing. You're not going to be an immigrant anymore. You're going to be like a national. You're going to be a nation. You're going to have a land for yourself. But always, as you come to worship, every time you come to worship, please recite this prayer. Deuteronomy 26, 5 through 11 says, Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean. You want me to translate that for you? My father was an immigrant. <laughs> My father was a wandering Aramean and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. The Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and on a stretched arm with great terror and with signs and wonders. And listen to this now. He brought us to this place. He gave us this land. This land, a land of flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring this fruits of the soil that you, Lord, have given to me. Place the basket before the Lord, your God, and bow before him. And this is interesting now. Then you 
and the Levites. And who? And who it says? The Levites and the foreigners residing among you shall rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given to you and your household. Pray with me. Lord, as we preach your word this morning, we ask for the anointing and the guidance of the Holy Spirit so that it will not be my words. It will be your words, Jesus, to your people today. In your name, we praise you and we pray. Amen. So before saying anything else, a little bit of a disclaimer. Let me uh, get it real clear. Anything I'm going to say, I'm about to say in this sermon is about, it should be taken politically. You understand that? So if you take something I say politically, you get it wrong. <laughs> so everything I'm about to say is supposed to be biblical, spiritual, and maybe personal as well. So not political. So the promised land, the land of milk and honey, when you think about what milk and honey was at that time when the, when the Israel, Israelites were conquering the promised land, Milk and honey was like the state of the art technology. Whoever had, whoever were able to harvest to have milk and honey were doing good economically. So nomads, immigrants, they were supposed to go from one land to another wherever they could raise their crops, have their crops and harvest. They will go. Once they, they, they harvest, they get the harvest, then they go to another land and plant their crops again. That's the way nomads worked. That's what the Israelites were up to this point. But in this point, they were, supposed, they were supposed to enter into the whole new development that is cattle raising. That's why the Bible talks about milk and honey. So the Bible is telling us that the Israelites were about to enter in a good economical position. Imagine from being a slaves in Egypt to being landlords, landowners, to own the land and a land with a whole new future, a whole new future with great economic possibilities. That's what God was putting before the Israelites in this moment. This is what the Israelites were about to do when we read this scripture from Deuteronomy 26, chapter, uh, verses 5 through 11. They were about to enter the promised land, the land of milk and honey, the land that is going to be theirs. They will stop being uh, immigrants. They will stop being nomads. And they were going to be now landlords. They were going to own that land, that land. Now, today, when we sing God bless America, let us find the meaning. What does it really mean? And how can we compare it, our situation today and with what the scripture is telling us? Let me put the, the text in context first. Let me put the, the text of scripture from Deuteronomy first. Genesis chapter 3 is like a, like a big landmark in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 describes the moment in which the world stopped being what God wanted it to be. So the world in the way God wanted it to be is in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. That is the perfect world that God created. In perfect harmony. But now in Genesis chapter 3 comes sin. And we, we as humans, we sin and we fall short of the grace of God. And Adam and Eve are thrown away. Thrown out of the, the Eden. And after that moment, I tell you that every human that descended from Adam and Eve are immigrants. Because they were thrown out of Eden. God called Abraham, descendant of Adam and Eve, to form a nation. And from that nation, he's, he will incarnate himself and come and save the world from sin. So God called Abraham. God calling to Abraham was interesting as well. Because basically God told Abraham, get out of your house. Get out of your household and become an immigrant. <laughs> and go to the land I will give you and I will give you, I will give you descendants. His descendants went from the land of Aram. That's what the Bible says. My father was a wandering Aramean because that's what they came from. That his descendants went from Aram to Egypt as immigrants. Guess for what reason? For economic reasons. There was hunger. They were starving for death. And the descendants of Abraham ended up going to Egypt and settling in Egypt. And being there for hundreds of years. God brought his descendants out of Egypt 
through the desert in a very long journey, in a journey that took them about 40 years so that they could come and conquer the land that it will be their own land. It will be their land. Now, in this text, God is talking to his people right when they were about to enter the promised land. The generation that left Egypt had, had, had been wandering for 40 years in the desert. And you might wonder, well, why a journey that, would, that might have taken them just eight months between from Egypt to the promised land, why did it take them 40 years? Well, I tell you what, the Bible is very clear that these immigrants, they had to really, they had to really flip a switch. And that, that switch flip happened changing one generation to another generation. So what happened in those years, in those 40 years between they left Egypt and they can come to this text in Deuteronomy 26, is that a whole generation of complainers pass away. Do you know any complainer around you? <clears throat> a whole generation of complainers pass away. It is here. It is in the Bible. The people of Israel, that generation that left Egypt. Moses, give me my water. Moses, give me my food. Moses, we would be better off staying in Egypt. And every time that generation faced some kind of a challenge, where would they find the solution? Going back to Egypt. They always found the solution. So it is interesting to see that complainers always find the solution in the past. If we only go back to do this the way we did it. Well, I tell you what, that was not going to fly for God. That generation would not conquer the land. God realized about that. So God let the time pass so that that generation will pass away. And a whole new generation emerged. And this generation was not a generation of complainers. This generation was a generation of conquering people. Free people. This new generation did not know slavery. They did not know what Egypt was like. So they were innovators. They were trying to innovate. They were always trying to find new things. They didn't know about anything from the past. So where they found all the solutions, all the solutions were ahead. They were not afraid to fail. They were not afraid to test stuff. Actually, when you find this new generation conquering the promised land there in the city of Jericho, how many times did they have to walk around the city? How many times? One, two, three. How many? Seven times they had to walk around this, around the this, this city. So you imagine if the old generation would have had to do that, probably by the third round, they would have given up. What are we doing? This is not working. But this were, these were conquered people. These were people with conquer, conquering mentality. So they were not afraid of try once, try twice, try three times, try four, try five, try six. And guess what? At the seventh time, they ended up conquering the city. So this is the people that Moses is reading the Bible to. Conquering people. Innovative people. People that are, that are all about innovation. People that are all about trying. Not afraid to fail. Do it once. Even though we have to do it seven times, we will still do it until we get it. This is the people that Moses was reading the Bible to. And Moses felt the need to do a second reading of God's commandments to that free conquering generation. The generation of Exodus 20 where Moses received the commandments of God for the first time was that all complainers generation. As soon as Moses comes down from, mount, from the mountains, they had already had an idol. <laughs> they told Aaron, his Moses' brother, to do an idol and they were already worshiping somebody else that is not God. That whole generation had passed away, and now Moses was reading this scripture to that new, not complainers, but conquering generation. And it is to that people that Moses reads this text. Deuteronomy 26, 5 through 11, is the prayer that God told his people to recite systematically as part of their worship as soon as they enter America. I mean, the promised land. As soon as they settled 
in America. I mean the promised land. The land of milk and honey. Honey, they should recite this prayer that we just read. Now, one thing that is really interesting in this prayer is that my father was a wandering Aramean. In other words, my father was an immigrant. Imagine that every time you come to worship, instead of reciting the Apostles' Creed of the Lord's Prayer, God will invite us to recite a prayer in which we will confess that our ancestors were immigrants. That's basically what God is telling us. Telling He, this new generation to do. Hey, you're a new generation. You, are, you don't know slavery. You're not uh, nomads. You're not immigrants anymore. You're going to be settled in Islam. But never ever forget that your ancestors were immigrants. Never forget that. So God wanted his people to preserve that immigrant mentality. That immigrant perspective. You wonder Why? Why would God want his people to always think, have that immigrant perspective? I'm going to give you two reasons. Number one, God wanted to prevent his people from having an owner mentality. Have you read Psalm 24? What Psalm 24 says? Psalm 24 is, is what it says loud and clear. The earth is what? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it are the Lord's. So this is God telling his people that immigrant perspective will always remind you that even though you are settled in this land, this is the Lord's land. This land is the Lord's. And number two, the second reason why God wanted his people to preserve that immigrant mentality is because God wanted to prevent his people from having a complacent attitude. We got here milk and honey. And the Bible doesn't say that it was fat-free milk. Not 2%, not 1%. The Bible doesn't say it was lactate or anything like that. It was lactose, fat, and everything in it. It was a land of milk and honey. So it was a land in which you will get there, you will settle, and you will enjoy, and you will get fat like Pastor Roberto and somebody else that I don't want to look at. So that's not the point. You're not getting the land just to get and enjoy yourself. You're not getting that land for that. I'm giving you that land. God, remember these people. I'm giving you that land because you in that land, you will be a light for the nations. And that's what Isaiah 49, 6 says. It's too small of a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. Listen to this now. I will also make you a what? A light to the Gentiles. And if you don't, if you prefer, I will tell you instead of Gentiles. I will make you, other versions say, I will make you a light for the nations. I will make you a light for the nation that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So number one, God wanted to prevent his people from having an owner mentality because the earth is the Lord's. And number two, we're not here just to get fat. We're not here just to get comfortable and enjoy good life. I mean, that's a good thing. But remember that the purpose that we're here is to make more and better followers of Jesus Christ from all the nations. To be a light for the nations. That's the purpose. That's why you are here. Now, when you think about the land belongs to the Lord and we see uh, the, everywhere in our, in our many, many words in our constitution and all that we see that we're one nation, what? On the God, indivisible with justice and liberty for all and everything that we say and we see what America, the impact that America has had in all nations as we celebrate Independence Day, there's no doubt that America has been a lie to all the nations. I mean, if you say amen for that, America has been a light for the nations. And that is true. Now, it is interesting how that has played out. Because if you say it that way, you might think it's just a one-way street. America has been a light to the nations. But the way it has worked out in practical terms is a two-way street. 
Because America has not only been a light, a beacon of light for the nations, but at the same time, the nations make up America social fabric. Yes or no? How many of you are Italian? Uh, your ancestors were Italian here. You want to raise your hand? There you go. We got two here. Come on. Any, uh, uh, we don't have Hispanics here, sadly. Oh, yes, we have. <laughs> oh, yes, we do. Uh, there you go. So any, descend any, any of your ancestors were like uh, English, from England or something? Remember, raise your hand. There you go. And uh, from Germany? Woohoo. So you see what I'm saying? Did I miss anybody? Can you say out loud your ancestors where they come from? Come on. Lebanon, French. Croatia. Say again. Sweden. Russia. Poland. There you go. You see, America has been a lie to the nations, but at the same time, the nations also form America. The nations are also part of the fabric, of the social fabric, the American social fabric. Let me give you some, let me give you some, some data. This is according to the U.S. Census Bureau. The ethnic diversity index in America in 2010 was 54.9. In 2020, it went down, right? No, it went up 61.1. Bring it down to Florida. 2010, 59.1, 2020, 64.1. Let's go to Hillsboro now. You need to, me to read it? Probably Hillsboro is one of the most diverse counties in the nation. So 62.3, 2010, 67.8 in 2020. That is how diverse we are. That means that America... America has not only been an example of freedom to the nations. You know what that means too? That means that the nations has found not only an example, but a home for those who are seeking freedom in the world. So how can we challenge ourselves not to be just an example, but to be a home Because that's what America is all about. America has not only been an example of freedom and democracy to the world. America has also been a home for those seeking freedom and democracy in the world. America has been a beacon of light and a home for me and my family. You want me to say amen with me for that? Amen. America has been a beacon of light for me and for my family. If you don't know what you mean when you say God bless America, I'm going to tell you what I, what I mean when I say God bless America. If living around 80 years is the life expectancy, 70, 80 or something, I can say that I lived half of my life under a communist dictatorship in Cuba. 39 years of my life I spent there. Living under a communist dictatorship. We saw the testimonies of these people in the video at the beginning of the sermon. You're about to hear another one. <laughs> so I lived for 39 years under, under a communist dictatorship. And if, we, if any of the things I'm about to say don't make sense to you, trust me, they don't make sense. They don't make sense because they are that, they are that weird. That's what dictatorship is all, is all about. I grew up going to school as a Christian. My mother was a pastor. I grew up going to school as a Christian. Uh, my school records had a box with something said on, on the side of it, and that box was checked. You know what that box meant? Religious beliefs. So my, 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 my school records had a box check saying that, This student had religious beliefs. And if you don't know what that means for communism, actually, let, me, let me give you a little bit of background real quick. Communism is a society that decides that God is not needed. They say we are going, we are trying to build a society without Caesar, without Lord, and without God. So a communist society is better off without God. They were trying to remove God from the society. 
In 1959, when Castro came to power, some of those communists prophesied that in 20 years there will be no church in Cuba. That they will get rid of all the churches in Cuba. And they really fought every, they really were fighting every Christian to really either turn your mind, get you out of Cuba, or do something with you. But you were just a problem to them if you had, if your faith was in Jesus Christ. So going to school as a Christian, I, I was bullied like crazy. I was bullied even from teachers. And like one of the people in the testimony said, there was nowhere to go. There was no police to call. There was no, because they were instructed, teachers in the school were instructed by the government that that's the way they should teach their, their, their children at school. You should really try to change their mind. Push it hard so that you can, you can, you can change their mind. So I was bullied like crazy for teachers and even students for my Christian faith. So growing up and even having my children, I didn't know what it was really to live decently and sleep well at night. Because of the many restrictions that we had growing up in Cuba. I mean, there was restriction for everything. Restriction for the food that you eat. Restriction for everything. There were so many restrictions that every night when I went to bed, I was like I probably sleeping with my one eye open because of the many rules I had broken during the day just to feed my family. Just to be able to feed my family. So I didn't know what it was like to live just decently and sleep well at night. That was the way life was like for me being there in Cuba. Many, many times... Our kids were instructed not to tell anyone. <laughs> Don't tell anyone what you ate last night. Don't tell anyone what you heard that we, we, we talk at the table. Don't tell anyone because if you tell anyone, you might get in trouble. Or you might put your parents in trouble. If you tell anyone about that. That's what growing up in Cuba was like that. On July of 2011... July 10th of 2011, around 9.30 in the morning, I cannot forget that moment. When I was sitting on an immigration chair in one of the immigration checkpoints in El Paso, Texas, and I was sitting with my family in one of the U.S. immigration checkpoints, and we were claiming for political asylum there. And I will never ever forget the physical reaction that my body had that morning. I didn't know. I felt such a sense of relaxation. I felt such a sense of my muscles like were relaxed. And I felt I could fit physically in my body that I was relaxed. So peace became something physical for me that morning. It was like God telling me, you have arrived. You are safe. You don't need to worry. Now, keep in mind that we were entering the U.S. We didn't know what life, life was going to be look like. We didn't know what we're going to work in. We didn't know what kind of job I would have. We didn't know a lot of things. Still, I had such a sense of peace. I had such a sense of peace because I realized that I didn't know that I had been living under so much fear before and I had such a sense of peace sitting there in immigration and immigration is a scary thing I tell you but even though it's a scary for me being an American immigration that could be a scary for somebody I was at peace I found God peace because it was like God telling my spirit even my body you are fine you have arrived six months later I was able to come to one of those places in Miami where they give immigrants uh, government aid. They help you really get on your feet and they help you. They give you, they give you some supplement for you to really go along the first time you were here in America. Six months later, I was blessed to go there and tell them, I already have a job. My wife already has a job. We already have a salary. Thank you. 
We don't need your aid anymore. Give it to somebody else. Isn't that what America is all about? Isn't that what America is all about? Yes. I was blessed to do that. We were blessed to do, say, give this aid to somebody else. We don't need it. We're moving on. That was six months later. Five years later, I was able to become, with my wife and my kids, I was able to become a U.S. citizen. And that is a blessing. Now, if you ask somebody what the American dream is all about, Maybe I would have a suggestion for you. Maybe think about what the American dream was for those people who came in the Mayflower. Think about what the American dream was for this, for those first pilgrims that crossed the pond and come here to settle in this land. Think what the American dream was for them. And see the evolution or the probably the American dream has really gone forward or backwards. <laughs> Because the American dream now is more sophisticated. It's that you have your home, you own, you own, you own, you own, and then you have safety in your retirement and all that. And that's, everything is that good. But let me tell you, I've been here in this nation for 11 years already. And let me tell you that my American dream is to have freedom to serve God and to live decently and sleep well at night. That is my American dream. And tell you that. You want, you want to hear something? We have reached. We have, we have reached our American dream. Serve God freely. Live decently. And sleep well at night. How many of you have, have achieved that American dream already? Or isn't that a blessing? So why we are so sophisticated and complicated and complain about some things that we haven't achieved, that changes our perspective completely. God told the Israelites in this verse, enjoy and celebrate the freedom in this land I give you. But every time you come to worship, every single time you come to worship, you and the Levites and the foreigners, those immigrants among you, shall rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given to you and your household. And that is a verse that is for us today. As we come to take communion today, let us never forget those who came before us and pay the very high price for us to be where we are today. And yes, I'm talking about those who have going to fight for this nation because freedom is not free. Do we celebrate them? Yes or no? I mean, we have all, the, all those symbols there. But let me extend that gratitude, not only to those who have really gone and fought for this nation, but also those First generation immigrants that came from England, from Germany, from Russia, from Croatia, from Cuba, from Mexico. Those first generation, those ancestors of yours that pay the price so that you will be here. That is basically what God was telling his people. As you come to worship, never forget your ancestors who were immigrant. My father was a wandering Aramean. Says the prayer that God taught his people. Let us never ever, as we have communion, forget those that came before us and pay the price for us to be here. I mean, I don't want my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren to say anything else about me. I just want them to put a picture of me on the wall. And I, I just want them to look at me and say, he had to learn a foreign language so that I could be born in that language. He had to go and pay the price of being a first generation immigrant so that I can be and be a second, third generation immigrant and I can enjoy the blessings of this nation. And probably that's what you, what we can do. Recognize, never forget the price that that first generation has paid so that we can be all here today. As we take communion today, let's never look down on those who are still among us 
and who are still paying the price so that their future generations would have the freedom of this land. We still have people among us who are first generation immigrants just like our ancestors. Let us never, never look down on them because they are praying the price for the future generations to enjoy what we all enjoy here today. As we take communion today, let us never ever take for granted the blessings and the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. Are you grateful for God, to God for that? So one of the interesting things about this country is one of the clear statements that I, sometimes I don't know how clear it is for someone. But one of our most clear statements is we are in one nation. What? One nation under God. I don't know if you understand what it says there that to be one nation under God is also saying that the only where, the only place, the only way that we will be one nation is where? On the God. So the only and true source of unity for this nation is who? God is the only and true source of, source of unity. So God is like that common ground that we come to. And that is what this table is all about. A common ground where we come and we are just thankful. Sometimes we just get too drawn, too, too intoxicated with our political opinions that we forget about what America is all about. One nation, only God. And that's what communion is all about. The place when we can all come and be one nation, a light for all the nations. And we remember that that is basically what Jesus had in mind. The night that he was going to be betrayed, he gathered with his disciples. I mean, those guys had different opinions, do they? They came from different political backgrounds. But still, Jesus took the bread. Still, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to them and, and said, hey, this bread is the symbol Just like this bread is broken, my body will be broken for you. So this bread is the symbol of God's love for you. God's love for all. So it is my prayer that as we take this bread, as we eat this bread this morning, God will give us that sense of being filled, being filled with love. The love of his sacrifice. The sacrifice of his body being torn apart. Let us never, never forget that. That same night after he took the bread, he took the cup. And he, he said, hey guys, the same way this juice is going to be poured through our throat, that same way my blood is going to be poured for all of you. So every time you take it, remember that my blood was shed for you. And it is my prayer that the Lord will use this as a symbol that for us, that we should know that in Jesus' blood, our sins are cleansed. How many of us say hallelujah for that? Hallelujah. Amen. And Lord, as we come to your table this morning, we want to do it with gratitude in our hearts. We come to you, Lord, Saying thank you. Lord, take these elements. Take the bread. Take the wine. We consecrate them to you. May they be your body and your blood to us this morning. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. Did you know you can take us with you wherever you go? Search for New Hope Sunday Sermon Podcast and Apple Podcast or wherever you get your podcast. To learn more about New Hope, please visit us at findnewhope.com.